Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Arnaud parked near the shopping center and looked out the window. It was an early August evening. The day was approaching its end, but in summer, the darkness comes late and the cool fresh twilight was still far away. Arnaud had a challenging day at work, checking the results of a month's development on a new project, but he even enjoyed the multitasking. Firstly, it was interesting to solve the constant questions that resembled an exciting game. Secondly, at the end of the month, there would be a good bonus on top of his already high salary. And thirdly, work matters distracted him from sad thoughts, preventing him from dwelling on the past. Fatigue and busyness served as his salvation from heavy emotions. Arnaud didn't hurry to leave the car. The interior was comfortable and cool, while outside it was scorching hot. The abnormal heat had been lasting for several weeks, and people eagerly awaited autumn to finally breathe freely. Arnaud looked out the window again and noticed two individuals within his field of vision, a middle-aged man and a slim teenage boy, tall and somewhat angular. They were walking and engaged in an animated conversation. The boy gestured actively and smiled from time to time. His gait was light and springy, with tanned long arms and legs, wearing worn-out sneakers. Whenever Arnaud saw boys like that, he inevitably pondered what it would have been like if he had a son of his own who would have turned 14 this summer and already had a passport. Perhaps his son would have been interested in programming or sports like football or basketball, or maybe he would have loved drawing. But what was the use of thinking about it when this boy was never born? And maybe it wasn't even a boy, but a girl, yet some sixth sense told Arnaud that many years ago, he lost his own son, and it was his own fault. To think otherwise would be an attempt to justify and deceive himself. Over the years, Arnaud had regretted his behavior countless times, but he couldn't turn back time. All he could do was to suffer from the guilt, yearn for the future that never happened, miss Vicky, and futilely search for her traits in others, to search and, of course, never find. Arnaud was a different person back then, young and somewhat selfish, even capricious. Before meeting Vicky, he didn't want to remember his past self. It was embarrassing. How could he have acted like that? Arnaud realized that his thoughts and memories were taking hold of him again. It happened sometimes, certain situations from the past, voices, images, all of it continued to haunt him, and he suspected it would never let go. Well, he had fully earned such a life. Arnaud was born and raised in a fairly affluent family for his city. His father was a successful businessman, and his mother was the chief accountant of a large plant. They lived in a big, beautiful house, had expensive toys, fashionable clothes, and went on trips. Arnaud never knew any denial. Besides his parents, his grandparents from both sides also spoiled him actively. The boy quickly realized that there was a sort of competition between them to see who the grandchild loved more. So, the cunning lad started using this situation to his advantage, playing with the emotions of his elderly relatives, manipulating them, and getting everything he wanted. Arnaud attended a prestigious gymnasium, where he always had many friends, boys and girls forming a strong and lively company. They were all from well-off families, so the teenagers lacked nothing, cafes, attractions, entertainment centers, and later, expensive clubs and parties in bars. Arnaud's life was carefree and fun. He enrolled in a local university and declined his father's pleas to go to the capital. University offers a completely different level and prospects. His parent tried to convince the grown-up offspring. However, Arnaud perfectly understood that he wouldn't have the same freedom there as he had here. At university, he would have to study hard and work over textbooks, otherwise, he wouldn't get his degree. But here, everything was already figured out. Guided by advice from older friends, Arnaud knew whom and how much to pay before the exam session so that he wouldn't waste his youth on lectures and seminars. He had no intention of deviating from his plans. As always, everything worked out exactly as he wanted. Arnaud became a student at the economics faculty of the local university, and a golden era of life began for him. He moved out from his parents' home, and as a gift for finishing school, his paternal grandparents presented their only grandson with an apartment in the city center. Meanwhile, his maternal grandparents, eager not to fall behind other relatives, gave him the keys to an expensive foreign car. Arnaud felt happy, 
powerful, and independent, with a bright and joyful life ahead, friends, entertainment, beautiful girls. There was simply no place for studies in this packed schedule. Arnaud hardly showed up at the university. He only appeared before the exam session to sort things out with the professors. It was a usual thing in their university. Arnaud now felt ashamed of his past attitude towards women during his college years. He considered them, perhaps, as beautiful objects specially created for him and people like him. He didn't care about the feelings of the girls, didn't listen to their desires, and chose his companions based purely on their appearance. In his youth, he was drawn to ladies with model looks, always big-eyed, uninhibited, and smiling. He simply didn't pay attention to others. There were no flaws in his pretty affluent girlfriend list. Girls gravitated toward him, approaching him at clubs or cafes, even ambushing him at the university doors with some request. Naturally, under such circumstances, Arnaud felt like a valuable prize, and he believed that anything was possible. Sometimes, Arnaud grew tired of easy relationships. He always preferred challenging tasks and would actively notice a particular girl, trying to win her over. It was like a game, hunter and prey. Some ladies initially pretended to be unattainable beauties, but Arnaud understood that the game had begun and used all his charm to break their resistance. He enjoyed this, feeling gallant, creating something akin to a beautiful fairy tale, massive bouquets of roses, cute plush toys, elegant jewelry. He also enjoyed bold, reckless actions, like singing a love song with a rock band under the window of yet another beauty. Arnaud loved coming up with something new, surprising, eliciting delight and admiration. And soon, the coldest snow queen would melt in his embrace. But when the game ended, Arnaud's interest quickly faded. The girl who had seemed so mysterious and attractive not long ago suddenly became dull and uninteresting. Arnaud distanced himself. He felt bored and melancholic, unable to bear the grayness in his daily life. To part with yet another lady of his heart, he had to be cunning. It was no longer as exciting and enjoyable as the beginning of the relationship, but what could he do? Arnaud didn't like women's tears. He was burdened by long conversations and pleas. All of it oppressed him and made him feel like a bad person. That's why he preferred a tactic of blame, always finding something to accuse a partner who didn't want to accept the breakup. Everyone had their weaknesses. Yes, it might have been too cruel, and it wasn't unlikely that the girls after Arnaud's outbursts developed complexes or even psychological traumas. But otherwise, they simply wouldn't let go. Different situations happened in Arnaud's life. One of his former lovers, Veronica, stood out in particular. After that episode, Arnaud became much more cautious. With Veronica, Arnaud met at a nightclub. She was the type of girl he liked, vibrant, beautiful, and uninhibited. She danced so enthusiastically on the dance floor that it was impossible not to notice her. Veronica was already a bit tipsy. Her long hair gracefully swirled as she danced. She was the center of attention and clearly enjoyed it. Arnaud had recently broken up with Amanda. They had been dating for almost three months, a record for a young man. Now, he was in search of new adventures. Of course, he immediately decided that he would leave the club that night only with her, the beautiful, young girl in a daring miniskirt and high-heeled platform sandals. Veronica looked somewhat even vulgar. Arnaud immediately understood that he wouldn't be bored with this girl. He didn't approach her right away. First, he needed to observe. He admired Veronica for about an hour before he dared to approach her. She came to the club with her friends, who had long since returned to their table, but Veronica couldn't leave the dance floor. She was savoring it all, the club atmosphere, the loud music, and her own movements. It was very appealing. Arnaud simply smiled at her, catching her gaze. She froze for a moment. Her huge blue eyes ran up and down Arnaud, and then their gazes met again. Arnaud admiringly studied the face of the girl who had immediately caught his attention. Up close, she was even more beautiful than from afar. Sculpted cheekbones, sharply defined lips, enormous, simply bottomless eyes, the girl. Without saying a word, she suddenly came very close to Arnaud. Enchanted, he watched her graceful movements and waited to see what would happen next. 
The beauty clearly took the initiative. It was very interesting and unusual, not following the script. Veronica looked intensely into Arnaud's eyes and kissed him. He, not believing what was happening, hugged the girl, pulling her close. She didn't object. Then they danced together, and Arnaud realized that he was charmed by this strange girl. He loved the spark in her eyes, a glimmer of light madness, and she was very different from others. Later, they finally introduced themselves and learned each other's names. Veronica took him by the hand and led him to the balcony, where it was quiet and deserted. You, I've never met anyone like you before, Arnaud confessed admiringly. Nothing surprising, there simply aren't any others like me, Veronica smiled. Veronica rented a room in the city. She had come here from a village and even managed to enroll in a law school, but studying was never really her thing, although she wasn't devoid of abilities. She simply enjoyed entertainment, socializing, dancing until dawn at nightclubs, and adventures, none of which aligned well with the role of a diligent student. In her first year, the beautiful Veronica fell in love with a young and charismatic history professor to the point that she couldn't think of anything but his gray eyes. Veronica always had a straightforward character. She was used to taking what she liked, and, of course, she didn't hide her feelings from the young professor. He couldn't resist the charms of the young beauty. The affair became known at the dean's office, and they forced the professor to resign, while Veronica herself was expelled at the first opportunity. It wasn't difficult to do, as she rarely bothered attending lectures. She was more attracted to the other side of student life. She didn't want to return to the village. It was boring and stifling there. Since childhood, she had dreamed of escaping from that swamp, but after being expelled, she couldn't stay in the dormitory, which was only available to students. Therefore, Veronica had to get a job as a waitress in a bar. After all, she needed money for food and accommodation. She was hired unofficially. They needed attractive waitresses to entertain the visitors. The pay was good enough to cover the rent for a small apartment, food, and even inexpensive but flashy clothes from local economy class boutiques. This life suited Veronica completely, the work wasn't dusty, and the atmosphere was pleasant. It was a large bar, and many guests gathered here every evening, while local musicians, mainly rock bands and soloists, performed on stage. Veronica liked this music. In general, she felt in her element here. Of course, both guests and staff noticed the young beauty, as well as the musicians. It was in this bar that Veronica met Diego, her first true love. He was the lead singer of a band that enjoyed great success there. They soon started living together, and Diego showed Veronica the world. They traveled to many cities in Russia. Diego's band toured the country, giving concerts here and there, parties, train stations, bars, and even concert halls. Then, as often happens, Diego met another muse. Veronica suffered from the breakup for a long time, but then she decided that wasting her youth on sorrow and regrets wasn't worth it, especially since she had another admirer. Veronica consciously decided not to fall in love anymore. It had twice brought her nothing good. Now she just lived, enjoying communication, youth, freedom, and indulging in pleasures. She was a little bit crazy, and that's what attracted Arnaud to her. He himself lacked her lightness and recklessness. Veronica could get behind the wheel after a bottle of champagne and speed past a traffic police post. Fearlessly, she sat on the rooftops of high-rise buildings, dangling her long legs over the edge. She easily connected with people and even committed shoplifting, not out of necessity, but just for the thrill of it. There were many other things. It's impossible to list everything. Arnaud never got bored with her. He never knew what to expect from the girl in the next moment, and it was dizzying. Veronica wrote poems and played the guitar virtuously, and she also joked wittily and sang beautifully. She invariably attracted people to herself, a life of the party, with whom you'd never be bored. And this amazing girl was head over heels in love with Arnaud, despite once vowing never to fall in love again. You're special. Veronica said seriously, looking at Arnaud. I feel good with you. You understand me, my soul. You're the best. Arnaud melted at those words and truly felt unique. 
it was pleasant to realize that Veronica, who invariably caught the attention of men wherever she appeared, was so devoted to him. A beauty, a wild spirit, she had many acquaintances, and it seemed like the whole city was her friends, but she didn't form close relationships with anyone else. They could hang out together, go somewhere, but she poured her soul out only to Arnaud. Veronica no longer communicated with her parents. They always wanted to mold something different out of her, change her, make her into someone she wasn't. What can I say? The girl sighed sadly. They actually wanted a son, and that's probably why they didn't like anything about me. Veronica didn't laugh the right way, too loudly and boisterously, didn't talk the right way, too much and too fast, didn't befriend the right people, didn't excel academically, and behaved too provocatively. In general, they picked on the girl for any and every reason, so she decided to run away from home as soon as possible, enroll in university, and leave for the city. Her father chose her field of study. He decided she had to become a lawyer. Veronica agreed, as arguing with her father was simply impossible. But once in the city, finally breaking free from her mother and father's total control, she dared to be herself, something she never regretted. When they found out that I got kicked out of the university, they wanted to take me back and fix me, but when I imagined that, no way. I defied my father's will, and he said that in that case, I'm no longer their daughter and can't count on their help. Live as you see fit, that's what he told me. But that's exactly what I wanted, so now I live as I see fit, and I don't regret anything. Arnaud was amazed, listening to Veronica's stories. She was a whole year younger than him, but she had already experienced so much in life, seen so much. Time passed, and Veronica with her endless parties started to tire Arnaud. Sometimes, he just wanted to spend time at home in front of the TV, but the girl repeatedly dragged him out onto the streets. Sometimes, she was irresistibly drawn to the bar. Other times, she suggested jumping into the river from the bridge on the city waterfront or just strolling through the city at night. The adventurous spirit that had once been so attractive to him now became a significant flaw in Veronica. Living with someone so unpredictable, never knowing what to expect from this wild girl. It used to be exciting and enjoyable, but now it was annoying. Veronica loved Arnaud, and he felt it, understood it, and, of course, he expected that breaking up with her would not be easy. However, he could not have imagined what followed next. Arnaud became more and more convinced that it was time to part ways with Veronica. She had been living in his apartment for almost a year, and her belongings were everywhere. Arnaud had never invited girls to live together in his home before, nor had he been with anyone for such a long time, so he didn't know how to handle the situation. Veronica noticed that something was off between them and asked questions. What's wrong with you? Is something wrong with me? What's happening between us? Arnaud remained deep in thought, sighing sadly at times, preparing the ground. Let Veronica figure out what everything was leading to, maybe he wouldn't have to explain anything. Yet, the explanation eventually came. It happened on a December evening when Arnaud returned home from university tired and angry. He had his diploma ahead, but he got an uncooperative supervisor. This person flatly refused to take money and demanded serious work on the diploma, but Arnaud physically couldn't manage to meet the deadline, and then there was Veronica with her perpetually carefree smile on her lips and untimely suggestions. Why are you worried so much about the diploma? She shrugged her graceful shoulders. People live without a diploma. And then Arnaud couldn't hold back anymore. Months of pent-up frustration burst out. He shouted at Veronica, calling her selfish, a shallow person living off others, not caring about the future. The pain and horror in the girl's eyes were overwhelming as she listened to it all. I'm sorry, I'll be the way you want me to be. She whispered quietly after Arnaud finished his angry tirade. He was shocked. This girl had fought for so long for the right to be herself and behave as she pleased, and now she said she was ready to change herself to please him, but it was too late. Veronica, I'm sorry for yelling at you. Arnaud said, trying to regain his composure. But, we need to break up. I wanted to tell you this for a long time, but I couldn't decide, and now it just happened on its own. No! The girl exclaimed. 
Desperation resonated in her voice. She clearly had no intention of giving up. No, no, no. Veronica, in a burst of emotions, swept the vase off the table, which, hitting the tiled floor, shattered into a thousand tiny shards. You can't, you can't do this, you can't drive me away, push me away. Veronica, we're adults. But I love you, more than anyone in this world, don't you understand? Arnaud looked at Veronica, who was in hysterics, and he increasingly realized that she was truly abnormal. What once seemed so attractive and mysterious was now repulsive, frightening, pathetic, and unpleasant. Go away, Arnaud said, backing against the door. He tried to avoid her embrace. Veronica clung to him like a drowning person clutching at a straw. He managed to push her out the door, and he wasn't particularly concerned about where she would go. Veronica had many acquaintances in the city, and she had admirers who would gladly take her and she wouldn't be left stranded. That same evening, Arnaud packed Veronica's things, cruelly perhaps, but he wasn't obligated to tolerate someone mentally unstable beside him just because he had foolishly brought her into his home. One of Veronica's friends later came to pick up the things she contacted Arnaud herself. How is she? The guy asked, more out of politeness. According to all social protocols, he was simply obliged to ask this question. She cries all the time, doesn't want anything. The friend sadly confided. Arnaud nodded, hoping that Veronica would soon find consolation and a new love. It had happened many times in her life. It was routine for Veronica, but Veronica didn't find comfort. On the contrary, she began pursuing Arnaud with her characteristic obsession. One day, Veronica showed up at his university dressed in an outfit resembling that of a nun, a mournful look, a floor-length skirt, and her beautiful hair tucked under a headscarf. I'm changing for you. She whispered, looking at Arnaud. See? I'm trying so hard. I'm different now. Submissive, obedient. I'll do everything you say. It wasn't just frightening. It was horrifying. Arnaud had to make significant efforts to get her to leave. And it escalated from there. Declarations of love and pleas for forgiveness appeared on the walls of the entrance hall where Arnaud's apartment was located. Veronica bombarded him with electronic and paper letters, some of which were even written in the form of poems. Wherever Arnaud went, he encountered her whether it was a shopping center, cafe, bar, or simply a park. Veronica pursued him, begging for attention and even resorting to threats. Arnaud didn't know where to hide from her. No amount of persuasion helped. It was as if Veronica wasn't listening to him. She continued to bend her line, and it was frightening. One day, Veronica attacked him. Arnaud had just defended his diploma and was returning home after the celebration dedicated to this long-awaited event. It was very late, and there was not a soul in the street. Arnaud got out of the taxi, paid the driver, and in a cheerful mood, he headed towards his entrance. Veronica charged at him like a fury, dressed entirely in black, making her blend into the pre-dawn landscape. If you don't want to be with me, then you won't belong to anyone else. Veronica attacked Arnaud, who was so surprised that he didn't immediately resist. The girl possessed some truly inhuman strength, but she overlooked one thing, he was still a man, meaning physically more powerful. Arnaud managed to push the attacker away, Veronica fell to the asphalt, hitting her back hard. What are you doing? Arnaud exclaimed. You've completely lost it, get help. I'm sorry. Veronica mumbled through her tears streaming down her cheeks. I don't understand myself. I love you, how could I do this? Arnaud quickly disappeared into the entrance, slamming the door loudly. His heart was now restless. Today Veronica had miscalculated, this attempt was destined to fail from the start. But what if next time she comes at him with a knife? Fearing a girl was something entirely new. Arnaud found himself in an unenviable position. The very next day, Veronica's friend, the one who had picked up her things, called him with a trembling voice, informing him that Veronica had tried to leave this world. The attempt was unsuccessful. The rope snapped at the last moment. They noticed her in time, and the ambulance arrived quickly, but now Veronica was in the intensive care unit. Arnaud didn't know what to do. 
He felt guilty about what happened to this girl, but at the same time, he still feared her a terrible, unpleasant feeling. Everything ended well for Arnaud, Veronica survived, but she was diagnosed with an illness that manifested itself due to extreme stress. At the time, Arnaud preferred not to dwell on what exactly caused this stress. They sent to a closed clinic. From mutual acquaintances, Arnaud learned that her parents now visit her. Apparently, they realized that their wayward daughter needed them. Friends also sometimes went to visit Veronica in the hospital, but Arnaud, he never met with her again, and, in general, he really wanted to forget this whole heavy story, but it didn't work out. Perhaps it was then that he first started thinking about how wrong he had been in his relationships with women. To him, they were merely objects the beautiful and valuable, but still objects. So many women's tears were shed because of him. He never considered their feelings, while many of them genuinely loved him. Since then, Arnaud became much more cautious. Now he listened carefully to women, noticed a lot, tried to be more sensitive and considerate, and always kept a safe distance. He had enough of carefree romances, pre-agreed conditions, no romance, but also no surprises he had had enough of Veronica's. Arnaud graduated from university. His father was pushing him into a good position at the local major enterprise, a gas plant. The salary was more than decent, and the prospects for career growth were impressive. Arnaud immersed himself in work. As a student, he was unremarkable, but as an employee, he turned out to be excellent. He delved into all the nuances, engaged in self-education, and observed more experienced colleagues. As for his personal life, Arnaud didn't consider any serious relationships. He was actively pursued by girls from respectable families, but Arnaud was like a rock. He had no desire for marriage, let alone children. It seemed like he hadn't lived enough for himself yet. Besides, he didn't need any unnecessary problems, and the story with Veronica was still fresh in his memory. Superficial relationships where everyone understood everything from the beginning were quite satisfactory for Arnaud. This continued for several years. Arnaud established himself in his profession, and now he was well regarded in his company. Young specialist climbing the career ladder, and it was the result of his merits, not the efforts of his influential father. By the way, his parents were very proud of their son's transformation. They never thought he'd turn out to be of any use. In his youth, he behaved like a typical spoiled kid of a wealthy dad. He didn't study, wasted his life, and spent money recklessly. His parents couldn't get through to him during that period, but then suddenly, Arnaud seemed to grow up and get sensible. His parents were happy about it, but for complete happiness, they lacked only one thing for their son to get married, start a family, and give them grandchildren. However, Arnaud was still very young, so his parents didn't insist too much. And then, in Arnaud's life, there was Vicky. Vicky came to their office for work-related matters. She worked as an economist in a partner organization, and there were some issues in the accounting department, so Vicky was sent to sort it out. Arnaud ran into her at the entrance. He was in a hurry to the parking lot since he was summoned to the management, and there she was, Vicky. This girl was not Arnaud's type at all, pretty but not possessing model looks, not tall, very skinny with short hair, attentive gray eyes, and freckles on her slightly upturned nose. She somehow reminded him of an elf from a fairy tale. Arnaud, without understanding why, stopped and stared at the visitor. She absentmindedly glanced at him and hurried on. In her hands, the elf girl tightly squeezed a folder with documents, and Arnaud, though in a hurry, followed her, not fully aware of his actions, just instinctively. He did not go in veins on the third floor. The elf girl stopped and began to look around anxiously, clearly lost. It's no wonder their office was quite a labyrinth. The intricate layout of stairs and corridors always confused newcomers. Did you lose something? Arnaud asked the girl with a smile. He was glad to have a chance to talk to her under such a benevolent pretext. Yes, the beautiful stranger smiled back. I need to go to the accounting department, and I seem to be lost. I'll be happy to accompany you, Arnaud replied. Arnaud intentionally led her along the longest route. On the way, they got acquainted, struck up a conversation. Vicky was easygoing and relaxed, as if she had known Arnaud for many years, and this manner really impressed the guy. 
he really didn't want to part with her when the door to the accounting department finally appeared on the horizon. Well, here we are, Arnaud said with a slight disappointment in his voice. Honestly, I don't want to let you go in there. Why? Are there some mean employees in there? Vicky joked. It's not about that. I just need to leave urgently right now, and when I come back, you won't be here anymore, and I really don't want that to say goodbye now and never see each other again, you know? I understand, the girl nodded, and then added. I feel the same way. After those words, a warm wave seemed to wash over Arnaud. He felt light and happy, and the world around him became vivid with colors. She likes him too, this is true happiness. Arnaud suddenly wanted to scoop her up in his arms and twirl her around the corridor, but perhaps it's still too early for such strong embraces. Pleasant to hear, Arnaud restrainedly said, but his shining eyes left no doubt about the joy he felt after her words. Arnaud asked for Vicky's phone number, she handed him her mobile phone, and he quickly dialed his number and made a call. Well, that's it, he smiled at her. Now we're in touch, and I'll definitely call you. I'll be waiting, the girl replied seriously. And he did call, of course, on the same day, as soon as he returned from the management office and reported to the boss. There were still a few hours left until the end of the workday. Vicky finished a little later than Arnaud. They agreed that he would pick her up right at work in the evening. He arrived a little earlier than the appointed time and sat in the car for a while, attentively watching the office building's porch. People were coming out of the doors, individually and in groups, but Vicky was not among them, and then she appeared. Arnaud jumped out of the car and rushed towards her. They spent some time in a cafe, getting to know each other better, sharing important moments about themselves. Vicky lived with her mother in a small apartment in a newly built complex. She graduated from the local university's economics faculty, which was the same university where Arnaud studied. Perhaps if he attended classes more often, he would have met Vicky earlier, though he doubted she would have caught his attention back then. At present, Arnaud couldn't quite understand what had captivated him about Vicky. Externally, she was not his type, but their conversations communicating with her was incredibly pleasant and effortless. They were very different. Arnaud was confident in life, enjoyed noisy gatherings, and was unafraid to speak the truth to people, even if it hurt them. He didn't like delving into the feelings of others and was known for his straightforwardness. In contrast, Vicky was very delicate, afraid of hurting others, and keenly responsive to changes in people's moods. She was calm, composed, serious, hardworking, incredibly responsible, a little timid, but at the same time capable of going to great lengths to achieve her goals. Arnaud and Vicky, they seemed to complement each other, like two halves of one whole. They were drawn to each other with an irresistible force. They didn't want to part at all, so they strolled until late at night, simply holding hands and sitting in the car, embracing each other. Vicky loved museums and exhibitions, and she also enjoyed leisurely walks, heartfelt conversations, and trips to the countryside to admire nature peacefully. Arnaud, on the other hand, showed her a different world. He took her to rock concerts and invited her to his lively and cheerful gatherings. Vicky found all of this very interesting. Arnaud knew for sure that she wasn't being insincere or pretending to be happy just to please him. First of all, they were very honest with each other from the beginning, so Vicky wouldn't hide her feelings. Secondly, Arnaud could see it in her eyes, there was admiration, enthusiasm, and genuine interest. Arnaud felt happy next to her and thanked fate for bringing Vicky into his life when their paths crossed at the office door and he didn't pass her by. Arnaud got acquainted with Vicky's mother, who turned out to be a pleasant woman, his parents' peer. She prepared incredibly aromatic tea from some garden herbs and baked mind-blowing pies. Vicky always complained that she couldn't do it well, but Arnaud was ready to forgive her for her lack of cooking skills and domestic ineptitude. Her shyness only endeared her more to him. Arnaud didn't know how to suggest that Vicky move in with him. After Veronica, he had never invited anyone to live with him. Of course, it would be more logical to propose to Vicky they had been dating for almost a year and both were at a suitable age for marriage. Still, Arnaud hesitated and feared making such an important step. 
There were many reasons for this. From an early age, his parents had warned him about reckless marriages. You're a prominent young man, well off, a more than enviable groom, his mother instructed her heir. There will be girls around you dreaming of a marriage of convenience. They marry rich boys at first, and then they divorce them and legally demand money and property from them. Do you know how many such stories there are? Be cautious. Not that Arnaud suspected Vicky of greed. No, he never thought of her that way. But the idea that marriage, a wedding, was an incredibly responsible and considered decision, and there was no need to rush with it, firmly settled in his head. And where were they hurrying anyway? They were both still young enough to live life to the fullest, have fun, travel, and ask for a wedding, marriage registration, and other formalities that could wait. Moreover, Arnaud still didn't want to deprive himself of a way out. Yes, everything was perfect between him and Vicky now, but who knew what the future held? No, Arnaud loved Vicky and was fully aware of it. He had never experienced such strong feelings for anyone else before, but who knew what lay ahead? The story with Veronica had made him very cautious. Besides, marriage implied having children, and Arnaud certainly wasn't ready for that. Taking on such responsibility, no way. He hadn't had his fill of life yet. There was so much interesting stuff in life without all these diapers and baby clothes. In front of Arnaud's eyes were examples of married people. With the appearance of children, the relationships between young spouses changed, and more often than not, it was for the worse. New parents got tired, dedicating all their time solely to the little ones. They began to blame each other for household issues and competed in the volume of domestic responsibilities. They seemed to stop living for themselves, and their conversations revolved only around the children, who went when, who had what talents, what strollers were better to choose, and all that stuff. These discussions filled Arnaud with a terrible longing. No, he wasn't ready for fatherhood yet. He wanted to live for himself and enjoy his youth, not dedicate all his time to screaming little tyrants. No, someday in the distant future, Arnaud saw himself as a father, but certainly not in the next five to seven years. In general, while Arnaud was contemplating how to suggest to Vicky that she move in with him, avoiding the topic of a wedding, she herself started talking about living together. Arnaud felt like a complete fool. He had been thinking about this so much, making plans, tormented by doubts, and all he had to do was have an honest conversation with Vicky, as he always did. It turned out that she had been thinking about moving in with him for a long time, and as for a wedding, she hadn't considered it yet either. I understand that I'm not supposed to say this, but I really wish to fall asleep and wake up in your arms. Besides, it's much easier for me to commute to work from your place. Arnaud beamed, he had finally resolved the issue that he had been agonizing over for a long time. Vicky seemed to be reading his thoughts, or maybe it was really the case. Now Arnaud and Vicky only parted during working hours, they lived together as one family. At first, of course, there was an adjustment period. Vicky turned out to be quite dependent in domestic matters, but it was understandable since she had been living with her mother. Arnaud taught her many things, cooking and quickly tidying up the rooms. It was fun and very endearing. It seemed that such activities brought Vicky and Arnaud even closer. Vicky turned out to be a capable student who quickly surpassed her teacher. She fell in love with cooking complex and unusual dishes. Maybe you should change your profession. Arnaud jokingly suggested while trying another gastronomic masterpiece prepared by the girl. Such talents shouldn't be hidden from a wider audience. Maybe I will. Vicky almost seriously replied. But not now. Maybe when I have some free time, I'll open my own little restaurant. That would be great. Over time, Vicky and Arnaud's friends got acquainted, mixed together, and became a very nice group. The young people enjoyed going out together, to the forest, to the river, or on a trip. Sometimes they gathered at someone's home and played board games. Arnaud had never realized before how entertaining and fun it could be. He had always thought that board games were only for kids, but he was wrong. One of Vicky's friends, Carla, always looked at Arnaud in a somewhat special way, which confused him a little. Is your friend Carla okay with me? 
Arnaud decided to have a conversation with Vicky about it one day. Yes, everything's fine. Vicky smiled. It's just that you bear a striking resemblance to a guy Carla was deeply in love with, but there was an unpleasant story there. Carla used to follow him everywhere, practically begging for his attention, while he just laughed and publicly dated other girls. He had every right not to start a romance with her, even if she was head over heels for him, but he was too cruel and bad in how he treated her, and Carla kept loving him and suffering. Wow, what a drama. Well, we were so young back then, just graduated from school. Youth is foolishness, and at that age, everything is forgivable. I never even saw him, Carla just used to tell me about him, and recently she admitted that you are his spitting image, quite a strange coincidence. And how did that story end? Nothing special happened, that guy went to the capital in search of happiness, taking another infatuation with him. Carla suffered, tried to find him on social media, and then it just faded away on its own. She started paying attention to other guys. It seemed like that story was forgotten, and then suddenly you appeared, and memories of her first unhappy love rushed back. Am I really that much like him? Very much so. According to her, he was also handsome, but the resemblance between you is only external. You are kind, sensitive, and deep, while he was selfish, superficial, and a phony. I don't know how Carla didn't notice it right away. She wasn't a stupid girl. Arnaud sighed. Vicky didn't know him in his youth, but he wasn't any better than Carla's former love. He had not spared anyone's feelings and manipulated girls just like that guy did. Thoughts of Veronica came back again. Where was she now? What happened to her? Arnaud shook his head, pushing away the unpleasant thoughts. Arnaud and Vicky lived side by side, enjoyed each other's company, went out, traveled, met with friends, went shopping together like a family. They supported each other in all situations and cared for each other. Throughout all this time, Arnaud felt free, and Vicky was okay with him occasionally meeting his friends. She could also spend an evening with her friends at a bar or club, and Arnaud didn't feel jealous. He was confident that Vicky wouldn't do anything wrong or betray him. This went on for several years, and Vicky sometimes thought about the future. She dreamed of having children. She already wanted to become a mother. Arnaud noticed it, but he was still not ready for parenthood. Arnaud and Vicky openly discussed this topic. I have so much more to do before having a child. Arnaud reasoned. I have career goals and other things to achieve. I dream of going on a tour in wild Africa, learning to pilot a plane, and starting my own business. All of this would be challenging with children to care for. I still have unrealized dreams and unfulfilled plans, so I'm not ready for kids yet. That's a shame. Vicky sighed. I've been dreaming of having a child with you for a long time. But if you're not ready, I'll wait. I want this child to be a joy for both of us. I won't settle for anything less. Arnaud was glad that Vicky understood and accepted his decision. He was willing to do many things for her, but having a child was not one of them, at least not yet. But fate, as it usually does, had its own plans. One day, Vicky shared some news with Arnaud that turned their established, happy, and carefree life upside down. Arnaud, we need to talk seriously. Did something happen? Arnaud felt a slight sense of worry. Vicky looked visibly distressed and pale, as if she might be seriously ill. Something did happen, and I don't even know how to tell you about it. Arnaud suddenly decided that she was leaving him. Fear gripped his heart with an icy hand. No, he wasn't ready to lose Vicky. What if she had met someone else? Speak directly and sincerely, as you always do. It's difficult for me to talk about this. After all, I know your stance on the matter. In short, I'm expecting a baby. What? Arnaud felt like he had been hit over the head with a bag of sand. The news had a strong effect on him, and he felt panic slowly washing over him. The thought of impending parenthood frightened him. I don't know how it happened. We were using protection, but these things can happen. I've already been to the doctor, and he said that no method provides a 100% guarantee, so... 
Vicky, you know that I can't become a father right now. Arno said softly, looking into her eyes. I'm starting to develop my business, and I have a long business trip ahead of me. Besides, I have so many other unrealized plans. It's not the time for a child, not at all. I understand. Vicky lowered her gaze. But this child already exists, you know? They even let me listen to its heartbeat, it's such a miracle. I know how much you want this, but I can't. Don't be afraid. Vicky took his hands in hers and looked into his eyes. Everything will be fine. Just think about it. We have everything we need to make this baby happy. An apartment, a job, money, everything. People give birth in much more challenging circumstances and still manage. We'll be happy too. Don't be afraid. We're together. Arnaud shook his head and suddenly an image of his friend, who recently became a father, flashed before his eyes, disheveled hair, a shirt splattered with porridge, red eyes from lack of sleep, and a silly, senseless smile on his face. No, Arnaud didn't want to become like that. Therefore, he insisted on termination. It was hard to say even that word, looking into Vicky's eyes, but what else could he do? It was about freedom and safety. Besides, he wasn't rejecting the idea of having a child altogether. Of course, they would have children with Vicky someday, but not now, definitely not now. How could she not understand? They had discussed this so many times and agreed not to rush with having a child. Do you at least understand what you're proposing to me? Vicky's voice had a steely edge, and it was understandable. It was difficult for her too. I do, but sometimes things happen. Medicine is advanced now, the timing is still small, and it will be quick and painless, with no consequences. Arnaud knew he was saying very scary words, but he couldn't do otherwise now, he simply couldn't. Besides, he had a say in this matter too because having a child would completely change and overturn his world. Vicky should take his wishes into account, but she looked at him as if he were a complete stranger. Her eyes held pain, disappointment, and disbelief. You're scaring me, Vicky said. You're scaring me a lot. If only you knew how much you scare me. Arnaud suddenly remembered his mother's words, her warning about cunning girls who get pregnant to marry wealthy men and then manipulate them. You just want me to marry you, Arnaud said. You're just like all the others, and I thought. Without saying another word, Vicky turned around and rushed out of the apartment, only taking the keys to her car from the mirror. Arnaud immediately realized that he had said too much. Of course, Vicky was not like the others. He had offended her for no reason. On the other hand, Vicky had to understand that there would be no child. Arnaud wasn't ready to become a father, and he had talked about it many times, and she nodded, agreed, or simply pretended to agree. Arnaud stepped out onto the balcony. He would call Vicky back, and they would calmly discuss everything and come to the conclusion that they had no reason to rush. Arnaud would even apologize for his harsh words because he really loved Vicky very much. She was the closest and dearest person to him, despite everything. But Vicky didn't even turn back at his shout, she was hurt. She got into her car, slammed the door loudly, and sped away into the distance. It's okay. Arnaud muttered to himself. She'll cool off, weigh all the pros and cons, and come back. She can't be without me, I know she loves me, and I love her, and we'll still be together. Arnaud pulled out a bottle of cognac from the bar and uncorked it, he needed to relax now. The strong drink made everything seem less frightening, the world became simpler and more understandable for a while. Arnaud sent Vicky a conciliatory text message, apologizing for his harsh words, confessing his love, and urging her to talk. He was even willing to discuss the issue of having a child since it was so important to Vicky. Perhaps he would make that sacrifice, after all, he doubted he would ever find a more suitable girl than her. He couldn't live without her, no matter how you looked at it. Even now, he keenly felt the absence of his other half. Yes, things didn't go as planned, and he panicked when he heard the news. It had just caught him off guard. But he would think everything through, weigh the options, plan it all out. Everything would be fine with Vicky. He just needed her to calm down and forgive him for his cruel words. 
Several times that evening, Arnaud dialed her number, Vicky didn't answer, of course. She was upset, maybe even crying. Arnaud frowned, it was unbearable to realize that he had become the cause of her tears. He wanted to bring joy to Vicky, make her smile, make her happy, but instead, he had made her cry. Arnaud knew how to fix the situation, he had spent the whole evening considering his position and accepted Vicky's point of view. Yes, Arnaud would do everything to make his beloved happy, no matter what it cost him. Now, with Vicky gone in an unknown direction in her car, Arnaud realized how much he needed her, how desperately he needed her. He wished Vicky would cool off and answer his call. That evening, Arnaud couldn't sleep, Vicky still hadn't shown up, and she didn't respond to messages or calls. She was offended, offended at him for the first time in her life, to the point where she didn't even want to hear about him. Arnaud watched some show on TV and absentmindedly scrolled through the city news feed on his phone. Suddenly, a message about a recent accident on the highway caught his eye, complete with photos from the scene. Arnaud stared in horror at Vicky's wrecked car. He had given her the car as a gift when she got her driver's license just over a year ago. Vicky was very embarrassed then. The gift was too expensive, but Arnaud was resolute in his decision, and she had to accept it. Vicky loved the car so much, she called it Swallow and would take it to the car wash more often than necessary, just because. Arnaud was still hoping that it was a mistake, that there were other white cars driving around the city, and after all, it wasn't an exclusive vehicle. But the ballet dancer cat charm hanging from the broken windshield, Arnaud bought it in Finland, where he was recently sent on a business trip, reduced the likelihood that someone else had the same one. Arnaud feverishly started searching for more information about the accident, but there was little information available. Apparently, the driver lost control and crashed into the roadside barriers at high speed, but Vicky was always so cautious. Arnaud used to tease her for her slowness, and he doubted she would drive at high speed on the highway, it just wasn't like her. But yesterday, as she ran away from him, she was in terrible condition. Why didn't he think to stop her, to grab her hand, hold her close, apologize, and not let her go anywhere? Driver hospitalized in critical condition, Arnaud read under a terrifying photo. Critical condition, but at least she's alive. Arnaud already called a taxi to go to the regional hospital. It was late at night, and a sleepy girl at the reception desk asked who Arnaud was in relation to the injured person. Learning that he was her partner, what an unpleasant word, the nurse said with a tone of regret that she couldn't disclose any information about the patient in that case. If only you were married. Arnaud bitterly smiled. He had no intention of leaving the hospital walls. He wandered around, trying to peek through the windows until a security guard sent him away, but he didn't give up. He returned to the clinic lobby, determined to find out something about Vicky's condition. There, he bumped into her mother, and they rushed to each other and hugged. The woman looked bewildered, frightened, and tearful, which, to be fair, was not surprising. She knew nothing about her daughter's argument with Arnaud, hadn't even suspected it, otherwise, she wouldn't have spoken to him. It was all his fault, he was to blame for what happened. How is Vicky? They won't tell me anything about her. She's in the intensive care unit after surgery, her condition is critical. The doctor says there's little hope, she. Did you know that Vicky was expecting a child? Arno nodded. Well, they couldn't save the baby. The doctors are fighting for her life. You two would have been so happy if not for this accident. You'd be expecting a baby, and I'd be happy for you. Arnaud nodded in time with Vicky's mother's words, not realizing that tears were streaming down his cheeks. Vicky's mother signed some papers, and they allowed Arnaud to see the girl in the ICU, albeit briefly. He sat next to Vicky, who seemed to be sleeping, surrounded by wires, holding her hand and talking, talking. He apologized, begged her to wake up, promised that as soon as she regained consciousness, they would get married and start planning for children, painting a picture of a beautiful shared future in the hope that these prospects would bring Vicky back to life because she had something to live for. Happiness was so close, why didn't Arnaud understand it right away? How could he speak so harshly to his beloved? 
It was unbearable to realize that Vicky was in this state because of him, because of their stupid argument. Usually, Vicky drove very carefully, and now. No one knew about Arnaud's guilt, but it didn't make him feel any better. He only dreamed of Vicky waking up. After the horrific accident, she would never be the same, but it didn't matter. Arnaud would be there. He would be her hands and feet if necessary, just to see her beloved eyes and hear her familiar voice again. But no miracle happened. Vicky never regained consciousness. One night, she was gone, and the doctors couldn't do anything. Arnaud didn't want anything anymore. He forgot to eat, stopped going to work, and didn't answer calls from friends. Life turned black, lost all meaning, and that feeling of guilt sometimes overwhelmed him to the point where he couldn't breathe. Arnaud even considered ending his suffering instantly. Why should he live? There would be no more good things because nothing could bring Vicky back. He didn't deserve happiness. It was all because of his foolish fear if his beloved was gone, completely gone. She loved life so much, dreamed so much about this child. Arnaud's parents hired a renowned doctor, but he couldn't do much to help the young man. He spoke some general phrases, tried to be clever, but he didn't know the whole truth. Arnaud couldn't tell anyone about his guilt. It was too heavy, too scary. One day, Arnaud ran into Carla, Vicky's friend, completely by chance when he was crawling back to his lair from the store. Now, Arnaud only made it to the nearest liquor shop and then straight home. Alcohol at least slightly numbed his consciousness and distracted him. Carla looked at Arnaud with sympathy and regret. She also experienced the loss of her best friend, and they were very close. But when she learned about Arnaud's condition, Carla came to support him an amazing person. The young man didn't object to her company and invited her to his place. They sat at the table, reminiscing about Vicky, crying, and suddenly, Arnaud decided to confess. He told Carla the truth, everything about his nightmarish behavior before the fateful accident. So, it's all my fault. He concluded. He thought Carla would insult and scold him, which would be quite reasonable and fair, but she pitied him just incredibly. You are not to blame for anything, it's just how circumstances unfolded. Carla stroked her nose head, like a little child, and it made him feel lighter. You were just scared, and Vicky was scared and confused too. You didn't want this, and neither did she. It rained that day, the road was slippery. It's not your fault, it's a combination of circumstances. Carla helped her know more than an expensive psychologist. They started calling each other from time to time and talking, and these conversations had a soul-saving effect on Arnaud. He gradually recovered, returned to work, and climbed out of the deep black pit where he had spent a long time. His parents were happy, colleagues and friends noted that Arnaud was becoming himself again, but they were all mistaken. Arnaud knew for sure that he would never be the same as before. Many years have passed since that dreadful day, and Arnaud still counted the age of their child. If he had been born on time, he would have turned 14 by now. When Arnaud saw boys his son's age on the street, he couldn't help but wonder what his child would have been like. Memories overwhelmed him again, just like now. Of course, that sharp pain he felt in the early days after the tragedy was no longer there, but the longing and sadness for what didn't happen now forever remained with Arnaud, and he had come to accept it. Arnaud didn't encounter a woman who remotely resembled Vicky, just as he expected. Perhaps there were none like her in the world, and he wouldn't settle for anything less, especially after experiencing true love. The kind that happens to people only once in a lifetime, and perhaps never at all for some. Arnaud was about to step out of the car to go to the supermarket when suddenly his attention was drawn to a three-year-old toddler, a tiny boy in a shirt clearly too big for him, who was briskly rummaging near the garbage bins. The child climbed on top of stacked boxes to reach the edge of the container, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to see inside. With his tiny hands, he diligently searched for leftovers in the trash. Since there was a restaurant in the shopping center, discarded food often ended up in the bins. All the local homeless people knew about it, so it wasn't uncommon to spot people scavenging near the bins. However, they were usually adults or teenagers, but this was just a little child. A child so young shouldn't be out alone like this. Could his mother or father be nearby? Arnaud looked around, 
there were no adults in sight. The little one was wandering on his own, and judging by his confident and business-like movements, it seemed like he had done this before. It was strange and very suspicious. Arnaud couldn't leave the child unattended, who knew what could happen to such a little one. Even if he accidentally fell into the garbage bin, he might not be able to get out, not to mention the dangers posed by large stray dogs, unscrupulous people, and speeding cars on the street. The child was exposed to numerous risks out there. Should Arnaud call the police and let them handle it? But what if the call somehow harmed the child? In such matters, caution was necessary. Meanwhile, the toddler finished his business in the garbage bin, picked up a bag of leftovers, awkwardly climbed down from the boxes, and headed somewhere while munching on a piece of bread crust. Arnaud's heart ached with compassion. He was so small, still walking with childlike clumsiness, and yet he had to find food for himself. It wasn't a situation a child should be in. No child should be rummaging through garbage bins for food. Arnaud couldn't ignore this situation. He got out of the car and followed the child, who was confidently moving towards a narrow alleyway. Arnaud kept an eye on him. A few hundred meters later, the boy found himself in a weird district that Arnaud had never been to before. It was surprising. This place was almost in the city center, just a few hundred meters away from the main street with well-maintained parks, luxurious fountains, and broad pavements. However, here it was poverty, neglect, dust, and garbage. The little boy approached an old gate, behind which there was an overgrown garden, and in the depths of it stood a long and painted house with a sloping roof. The child pushed the old door and slipped through the gap. Arnaud watched from outside to see what would happen next. Were there adults waiting for the child inside? Why would they let such a little one go alone? The boy climbed up the porch steps and disappeared behind the slightly open front door. Arnaud hesitated for a moment. The child was home, nothing had happened to him, and he could just return now, having made sure the toddler didn't get into trouble. But Arnaud's heart remained restless. He felt sorry for the little boy. The uncertainty scared him. What if something was wrong with the child right now? What if he was in danger? And so, Arnaud knocked on the gate. He couldn't find a doorbell, so he had to use force. After a minute, an old man appeared on the porch, skinny, not tall, wearing worn-out knee-length sweatpants and an unwashed undershirt, his unhealthy red face covered with stubble, and his eyes swollen and hazy. It was clear that the man was either drunk or in the process of coming out of a binge. Are you coming to me? inquired the old man with a hoarse voice. To you, confirmed Arnaud. What's this about? The old man asked about the reason. About the child who just came home. Replied Arnaud. Are you from the Child Protection Services? A hint of threat could be heard in the old man's voice. No, Arnaud hurried to reassure him. Just a passerby, I wanted to talk to you. Did my Santino get into some trouble again? The old man grumbled under his breath. Well, come in, the gate isn't locked. The courtyard resembled a dumping ground, piles of garbage and broken bricks everywhere, beer cans and bottles from cheap drinks scattered around. And unexpectedly, amid all this chaos, there was a makeshift sandbox. So, what do you want? The old man inquired impolitely. I just thought maybe you need help. The child was alone on the street at this age. I found him searching for food near the shopping center's trash bins. Ha, huh, there's the little rascal. The old man smirked. I've told Santino so many times not to go there alone. It's far, but he doesn't listen. The child was looking for food. He was clearly very hungry. Who is he to you, related to you? Grandson. The old man replied. My only grandson, and you're right, kind senor, we could use some help. I can't work anymore at my age. What about his parents? I asked that too. The old man grinned. I'd like to know who Santino's father is, but it's a mystery to me. My daughter, Sylvia, got all confused in her statements when the kid was born, and she herself, Santino's mother, has been gone for about three months now. And you didn't raise an alarm? Arnaud was surprised. What if something happened to your daughter? What can happen to her? 
The old man waved his hand. It's not the first time, far from the first. She's a party animal. Santino hardly knows his own mother. Sylvia started drinking at 15, and it only went downhill from there. She gave birth to Santino, seemed to calm down a bit, and then she went off the rails again. It's not in her style, taking care of a baby, that's how my grandson ended up with me. He's safer with me, but Sylvia, she's hopeless. She would have killed her son long ago if not for me. Arnaud raised his eyebrows in surprise. If a child is better off with this clearly alcoholic man, then what kind of mother is she? So, there's nothing to worry about Sylvia. The talkative old man continued. If something happened, someone from her friends would have told me by now. You talk about raising an alarm, searching for Sylvia, but if the child protection services find out about what his mother is like, they'll take Santino away from me and put him in an institution. He's already attached to me, and I to him, the little one can't do without me. Arnaud had completely different thoughts on the matter. He believed that the child would be better off in an orphanage than in a crumbling house with a drinking grandfather. Besides, they feed the kids well there, and little Santino wouldn't have to worry about food. Grandpa, who's this? Santino, a small, adorable, black-eyed boy, rushed out onto the porch, attentively inspecting the uninvited guest. Arnaud smiled at the child. He was so endearing, so vulnerable. Arnaud realized that he couldn't just leave and forget about this child. He didn't understand what was happening to him. Arnaud suddenly felt the urge to protect the little one from all the hardships and misfortunes that had befallen him. This is a nice uncle. The old man explained. He wants to help us. Are you hungry? Arnaud asked, trying to make his voice as gentle as possible. Nope. Santino shook his head negatively. We have plenty of food at home. I brought it. Do you want to eat with us? Arnaud immediately went to the nearest store and bought two bags of groceries for Santino and his grandfather. There was meat, fruits, and sweets for the little one, as well as some cheap plastic toys from a local shop. Santino was overjoyed with them. Arnaud later pondered a lot about this chance encounter. Santino was in danger with such relatives, but his grandfather was right and orphanage wouldn't be any better for the child. Santino was so sensitive, vulnerable, and endearing, he needed love and attention. And his grandfather loved him, loved him in his own way, and the boy could feel it. The orphanage would be very hard for him. Arnaud now often visited Santino, bringing food, toys, books, enjoying the time spent playing and chatting with the little boy and having conversations with his grandfather about life. The man kept an eye on the child. He couldn't leave him. Santino's grandfather continued to drink, sometimes alone, sometimes with drinking buddies. They seemed to be peaceful, harmless people, treating Santino with warmth and concern, and no one harmed the boy, but still, there was nothing good about him being in such an environment. Santino's mother never appeared. It seemed she had forgotten about her son and father altogether. Let her be. The old man waved his hand when Arnaud asked about his daughter. If she doesn't show up, everything's fine with her. She'll be back as soon as she needs something. It's happened before. Arnaud tried to get Santino's grandfather into the hospital. After all, his age was quite advanced, and maybe treatment would help, and the old man would stop drinking, and perhaps even take care of his grandson. Miracles do happen. However, in this case, the grandfather adamantly refused any treatment, insisting that he was perfectly fine. What's the fuss about? I have a house. There's food in the fridge. Not everyone is as wealthy as you to live. Most of the country is struggling, just like us and Santino. Don't make a tragedy out of nothing. You're helping a boy from a poor family. Well, thank you very much. It is not in vain, but other things are not your business. The old man couldn't agree that he was doing something wrong. In his worldview, such a life was a normal variant. Everyone lived like that. Arnaud continued to visit Santino and help the family with groceries. He didn't understand himself why he had become so attached to Santino. Perhaps he saw in him his own unborn son. The little boy was drawn to Arnaud. He loved him with all his heart and even made some crafts for him. It was very sweet. 
Arnaud caught himself thinking that he was eagerly waiting for Fridays, the day he visited Santino and his grandfather, and no other tasks could distract him from this visit. Santino's grandfather had Arnaud's phone number. He had given it to him just in case, in case they urgently needed help, but the old man never bothered him. However, now he called in the middle of the week, and Arnaud immediately sensed that something was wrong. We have trouble. The old man reported. Come, they're taking Santino away from me. Arnaud rushed to the familiar house. He was very worried about Santino. What if something happened to the boy? The old man hadn't explained properly where they were taking him, maybe to the hospital. But Santino turned out to be healthy. He was sitting on the old man's lap, crying, and looking at the two policewomen with fear in his dark eyes. When Santino saw Arnaud, he burst into tears again, perhaps relieved, and his eyes were filled with hope for his kind uncle. See, I told you. The old man patted his head. I told you that Uncle Arnaud would come, and everything would be fine. What's going on? Arnaud asked the policewomen. We are trying to take the child to place him in a children's institution. One of the women explained. And this man, who claims to be the boy's grandfather, is refusing to give him up. He's upsetting the child. The second officer added, The boy is scared of us now. He clings to his grandfather and won't come to us. Santino's mother passed away. The old man explained from his corner. Tears welled up in his eyes, but he forced them back with willpower. It turns out that she died in the garage with her friends a week ago, drinking and listening to music in the car. Well, that's it. And now they want to send Santino to an orphanage because I'm nobody to him on paper. But I won't give him up. You can't take him away from his own grandfather. So that's what happened. Stipa was now an orphan, and it was unlikely that they would leave him with his grandfather. His age wasn't suitable, and his way of life was far from ideal. But it was true, Santino couldn't be sent to an orphanage. He would break there. He was a free-spirited and curious little boy who needed love and attention. It wouldn't be easy for him in an institution. Can't we leave things as they are, at least for now? Arnaud clarified. The thing is, the mother wasn't involved in the child's life. He didn't even know her. He was raised by his grandfather, and nothing will change in that regard. He'll continue living with him as he did before. I'm looking after him. I promise to be here every day to help out. We have orders to take the child. The elder policewoman shook her head. We must take him away. The grandfather can try to apply for custody, but honestly, I don't think it will work. What if I apply for custody? These words flew out of Arnaud's mouth before he had a chance to think the idea through thoroughly. As the phrase left his lips, Arnaud realized that he truly meant it. He was ready to become Santino's father, loving, caring, and attentive. I don't mind. The grandfather reassured, hugging his grandson. Santino will be fine with Arnaud. They love each other. I'll sign everything necessary. Just don't take him to an orphanage. You? The policewoman was surprised. You can, of course. We can arrange temporary guardianship for you. It won't be for long. But if you want to take him permanently, you'll have to go through the foster parent training, gather numerous documents, and also get the consent of your spouse. I'm not married. Well, then adoption is out of the question. The child needs a complete family. All right, let's arrange temporary guardianship for now, and we'll figure out the rest later. That can be done, but the child cannot live here. These conditions are not suitable for him. Agreed. Arnaud quickly arranged temporary guardianship for Santino, and he moved the boy to his own place. Santino's eyes widened in surprise when he saw the clean and spacious apartment. He had never been in such houses before, and he clearly liked it here. However, Arnaud needed a nanny for Santino since he had a lot of work to do and couldn't dedicate all his time to the child. Then, Arnaud remembered Carla, Vicky's friend, kind, sensitive, and understanding. Carla had once helped Arnaud recover and get back to life. They still communicated occasionally, exchanged messages on social media, and congratulated each other on holidays. 
Arnaud knew that Carla had recently divorced her husband and left with her young daughter, Santino's peer. Due to constant illnesses, she lost her job and was now earning some meager income. Arnaud had offered her a job at his department more than once, but Carla declined as she needed to take care of her daughter. The girl was very sickly and couldn't attend preschool, so working was out of the question. Now, Arnaud had a wonderful proposal for Carla. She could become Santino's nanny. He would arrange a good salary for her, and she could carry out her professional duties without being separated from her daughter. Everything would be perfect, Carla with the money and job, her daughter with her, and Santino well taken care of. Besides, kids of the same age would surely have more fun together. Carla gladly agreed to the proposal. Now, every morning, she would come to Arnaud's place with her daughter, and he could head to work with a peaceful mind, knowing that Santino was in good hands. It was an incredibly cozy and tranquil time. Arnaud enjoyed coming home now, where he was greeted by a smiling Carla and cheerful kids. The kitchen filled the air with mouth-watering scents of homemade food, and children's drawings were scattered on his desk. Everything was clean, comfortable, and warm. They would have dinner together as a family, talk, laugh, and share their daily news. Of course, Arnaud never forgot about Santino's grandfather. He made sure to visit him and Santino every weekend, and the old man was genuinely grateful to Arnaud. Fortunate, you are, grandson, the old man would say, ruffling Santino's hair. I don't know what deeds fate had you do to be blessed with such a person. However, after a few months, Arnaud received a call from the Child Protection Services reminding him that Santino would soon have to be taken to the orphanage. The term of temporary guardianship was coming to an end, and just the thought of it made Arnaud's heart freeze. Santino, the trusting and adorable little boy, would end up in an institution unless Arnaud found a way to adopt him. Arnaud had the means, with more than enough wealth, but they could only give the child to a complete family. That meant Arnaud had to get married, even if it was a fake marriage on paper, to meet the requirements. The only question was, who could he turn to with such an unusual request? It had to be someone he could trust. The answer came naturally, the perfect candidate was right at Arnaud's home every day. Carla, we need to talk seriously, he said to her one day. Arnaud explained the situation to her, why he needed that stamp in his passport, and finally made the proposal. Carla listened to him attentively, occasionally forgetting to breathe. Arnaud looked at her, convinced that she would decline. Any moment now, she would voice numerous reasons why she couldn't do it, and she would be right. It was indeed an unusual situation. Arnaud, please tell me, do you not remember me at all? A strange question. Arnaud stared at Carla in amazement. Well, of course, I remember. Vicky introduced us. What do you mean? No, we were acquainted before that. Carla sighed. Or rather, I knew you. You probably didn't notice me at all. I used to follow you around the university, trying to catch your eye, trying to get to know you. I was head over heels in love with you, and it seemed like you changed girlfriends like gloves and, as I thought then, laughed at my feelings. Later on, I realized that you never noticed me at all. Wait, that was me? Arnaud couldn't believe what he was hearing. Vicky told me about a past love of yours, but then the guy apparently moved to the capital, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I told my friends that when I decided to turn that page in my life, they didn't know who that person was. I talked about you, but never showed you to them. Wow. Arnaud could only manage to say, This is so strange and unexpected. Apologies for that oversight. Here is the translation following your request, using dashes for direct speech without quotation marks. And now, after many years, you suddenly propose to me, Carla smiled. Clearly, it's not real, but still. That's the irony of fate. Did you really love me that much? How could I not notice? Arnaud wondered. Loved, never felt such strong emotions for anyone else. It was for the best that they were too intense, even destructive, but later, I managed to forget and stop loving you. I grew up and realized that you were an egotistic and reckless playboy, incapable of responsible and brave actions. 
You're right, that was me, Arno admitted. Not you, not anymore. That person doesn't exist anymore. Before me now stands a kind, brave man, attentive, grown up, and reliable. This person couldn't ignore the suffering of a little child. This person solves problems, not running away from them. So, are you falling in love with me again? Arnaud joked, still unable to get over Carla's unexpected confession. Quite possible the woman smiled. Why not? Well, will you marry me then? What do you think? A deserted beach, covered with soft white sand, turquoise calm waves of the ocean, the red sun rapidly descending behind the horizon, seagulls soaring in the distance over the sparkling water. On the shore, a family gathered, a tan man in blue swimming shorts played football with two children, a boy with intelligent black eyes, and a charming girl. Shouts, laughter, and merry commotion filled the air. The mother of the family smiled, watching her happy loved ones from a comfortable sunbed, sipping a tropical cocktail, and wearing a wide-brimmed hat. She looked relaxed and content. The head of the family finally got some time off, and they decided to go to the ocean coast together. The woman got up and slowly approached the beach footballers, causing clouds of sand to rise from under their feet. Arno, it's time for the kids to have dinner, and they need to go to bed early. Remember, we have an excursion at 8 tomorrow. Of course, the man smiled, then stepped closer, wrapped his arms around her waist, and tenderly kissed her. Listen, children, you should obey mom, the kids protested, not wanting to end their playtime. But we want to play some more, the little ones objected. Well, we will play some more, have a shipwreck in the bathtub, and then compete to see who falls asleep faster. Hooray! The kids clapped their hands. You're just an amazing father, Carla smiled. And as a husband, the best in the world. How lucky I am to have you. Arnaud embraced his wife again, then lifted the children one on each arm and the family headed back to the hotel, filled with happiness and love. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.